who is this guy, Henry, that you paid the guy to assassinate this person over here? Stoop, and he sighs, and he goes, so there's one more prophet, uh, Micaiah, but I hate that guy. I hate him. <laughs> and it says in the text, <laughs> there's this one more prophet, but I just hate that guy because... He never says anything nice <laughs> about me. He never prophesies anything good. Okay, we did a deep dive on Genesis. That was fun, and I know that we could have kept going, but it's like, you know, we got to spare some of this energy for other th things. I like the idea of understanding it from its antecedent in Mesopotamia. And Josh, you're an Assyriologist. You're well aware of the languages that these are originally written in. And Akip, <clears throat> you pay attention to all this stuff in the Hebrew Bible and Dead Sea Scrolls. So I want to talk about God lying again, or I'll phrase it another way. If we were in the court of law and the judge said, Mr. Lambert, who is this guy, Henry? He shot your enemy and it shows a pay stub that you paid the guy to assassinate this person over here. Um, and I said, your honor, <laughs> I didn't pull the trigger, okay? Do you think the judge will find me guilty of committing murder or trying to have someone killed if I paid the assassin to go and commit the murder? I didn't do it directly, therefore I'm innocent. I mean, if you're God, yeah, probably not, right? Yes, that's the key. You, gotta be, you have to be divine. Right. It's the only time it works. It'll have to be the right divinity. That's the, that's the, 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 the yeah. real one. Yeah. I think you see what I'm leading up to here for everybody who might be watching, and that is God lies in a way that may not be direct here. Maybe you know somewhere he's more direct, but uh, like Genesis. But in this case, he purposefully sins a lying spirit to have people lie. And uh, tell us about the story, guys. He's manipulative. Mm. He's very, I love, so, I mean, I love this story um, for a number of reasons. One, one of the things that I like about it is that it, it, it provides, I think it provides a nice narration of how, how prophecy worked in ancient Israel, in Canaan, in in the ancient Near East, there's a there's a whole story here about, you know, prophets interacting with 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 kings and with each other. How this whole institution kind of functioned. But in First Kings chapter twenty two, there is a story of I think it's uh, it's Jehoshaphat mm -hmm. and Ahab. Mm -hmm. Jehoshaphat is the king of Judah. Ahab is the king of the much more powerful northern kingdom that we we call Israel was probably called Samaria and and they get together uh to form an alliance and go out and fight who are they Ramoth Gilead Ramoth Gilead yeah that's right so they're going out to to fight against Ramoth Gilead because I think it's Ahab is insisting that Ramoth Gilead belongs to him hmm. right and and so he's invited Josh about to come along and help him out and Within this story, uh, uh, Jehoshaphat is, is sort of he's he's the Judean, right? So he's he's the good guy. He's right. he's being promoted as like he's he's the king who is trying to do the right thing. So he's the one who actually suggests, well, before we go out, let's make sure that we consult the prophets first. And so they get together four hundred prophets in order to to inquire about whether. You know what's the result here should we go out and and embark on this campaign are we going to be successful what's what's yahweh telling us to do and i, I think the the prophets all say yeah go hmm. you're you're good get out there um yahweh will give you victory and this is my i i love this part of the story and that josh can pick it up but but what i love is jehoshaphat then goes <laughs> I don't know. He's like, are you sure this is all the prophets? Like, if we asked everyone about the result of this campaign, and you could almost see Ahab's <laughs> shoulders <sighs> stoop, and he sighs, and he goes, so there's one more prophet, uh, Micaiah, but I hate that guy. I hate him. <laughs> And it says in the text, there's this one more prophet, but I just hate that guy because he never says anything nice about me. He never prophesies anything good. But Jehoshaphat 
insists you got to hear from you, you got to do this right you got to hear from everybody so uh they 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 don't we don't know where he is they 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 go looking for for Micaiah Micaiah the son of Imla Imla that's it that's right so they got to go they got to go find him to make sure that they they get this right yeah and <laughs> so uh of course Micaiah eventually comes and the you know the two kings are sitting there and he said, all right, <clears throat> you know, what's the, what's the deal? Are we going to, you know, are we going to be able to have victory? And, um, and so Micaiah says, you know, like essentially, yep, good to go. <laughs> Going up. You guys are going to win. <laughs> then say, I, how many times have I told you, tell me the truth. Right? And so Micaiah says, all right. Like, no, I think, no, I, I, I think it's Ahab, Ahab at this point is like, <laughs> Because yeah, because he's he's literally every single time he consults Micaiah. Yeah. Micaiah never has anything good to say. So right away, Ab's like, Do, huh? "Wait a minute," because he's saying so, he's you know he's you're, you're like saying yeah. So he, he feels like something something's off here. Right? Something is amiss. <laughs> and so he presses him, and Micaiah says, "All right, you know, I'll tell you I'll tell you the truth." I and mean, he talks about this vision that he had. And so he sees Yahweh seated on the throne and the, the divine councils come around him. He's basically saying, all right, who is going to essentially go up and lie, uh, you know, or, or who's going to go up and uh, persuade the, uh, th these kings to, to go up and to essentially to die, uh, to, to fight against Ramoth Gilead and die. And one says one thing, one says another thing. And then finally, this lying spirit comes forward or the, the spirit comes forward and he says, all right, well, what, do you, what are you going to do? And he says, I will go and be a lying spirit in the mouth of the prophets. And so Yahweh says, yep, good idea. Go do it. You're up. And uh, and so, of course, uh, this is, you know, this is sort of the the problem when you come to this passage. If you're looking at it through uh, this more evangelical lens, it's like you can't have Yahweh lying like this. And so it's it becomes a problem. And so, you know, as Derek said, well, you know, Yahweh... Uh, he allowed this spirit who was going to do this anyway. Um, he, he allowed it to happen. That He's makes not him... the one who's lying. <clears throat> right. Right. Yeah. Well, that's the <clears throat> just bringing up two points. It doesn't sound like that's what's actually being said. No. Sounds like God's directly saying, who's going to go? Yes. He's wanting to commission yeah. someone to lie. Two is that this kind of brings up the whole Euthyphro uh, argument of like, does God do good because good just is without God or or is God above what is right and wrong and justice and can do what he wants? And in this case, if I were stuck trying to be honest with this text, I would say God's above right and wrong. Yeah. I would have to. It's I, I just, good because God does yeah. it. Exactly. Yeah. So it's whatever God does, even if it's bad for us, it's actually good from his perspective, yeah, his yeah. point of view. And that, whatever God chooses, is right. Paul says, who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Can the thing made? You get the point. Yeah. And the, the issue here is if you, you know, if you don't take that approach and you wrestle with it because, you know, God who cannot lie, you know, like these are, this is sort of a, a, a theme, uh, particularly as, um, I, th I think, as the theology develops. But, you know, you start to make these sort of special pleading cases. And my response uh, when I hear this sort of thing is like, I'm using a microphone, right? Like I, the, the, I'm not directly recording onto that SD card. It's, it's this electric signal that is, it's actually the microphone that's doing it, right? It's not me. Uh, and, and so I can't really be blamed for what's being said here is the microphone that's doing it. But of course, no one like, <laughs> This is a microphone. It's designed to transmit my message, right? That's what it's for. And so no one, you know, would uh, would be able to say, oh, well, he didn't really say it. It was the microphone that said it. Like, that, it doesn't work that way. And in this case, that's all the spirit is. And if certainly this is all the prophets are. And the, the, the other interesting thing about this that's sort of the, a further complication to be thrown in is the fact that Micaiah lies as well and that's something that i think is missed in the story when you read it you know because it's funny but, yes. but you don't really pick up on it is that had they had not pushed back they would have walked away going yep all good awesome yeah and micaiah would have also lied right so um i this is this is an incredibly problematic passage but again 
it, it, it speaks to, I think, this problem that we have with like a systematic theology. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because when you, when you come to ancient texts and you're coming to them through the lens of a later text or a theological structure that you've put over top of a later text that then reinterprets the earlier text, mm-hmm. You run into these problems. Yeah, I'm. I am constantly getting after uh, people on on Twitter and in 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 the comment space of my own YouTube channel about how badly people misunderstand these texts because they are they are they are not in a position or or, or they're they're not able to even imagine a different world yeah. from our world, like. In this is not, uh, I mean, I don't think it's too strong to say that when the Deuteronomistic historian wrote this story and the first people were reading it, I don't think they were troubled by the fact that Yahweh was intentionally deceiving Ahab. Because, on the, I mean, on one hand, they can't stand Ahab. So they're like, right. yeah, man, just whatever. Yeah, so whatever you got to do, to Ahab is fine. But the other thing is people in antiquity, including the ancient Israelites, the they had this perspective of God, which was very much like just, you know, people, but more. Everything that people can do, the gods can do, but, you know, on a much grander scale, including lying. Yeah. A, a question that I've never really thought of before until just, just you were, just now as you were talking about Micaiah, also having to lie it makes me wonder when he spills the beans at ahab's insistence and gives up the game basically and Mm. says you know this is this is what's going on is he defying yahweh at that point Mm. because he's telling the truth he's now telling he's he's given up the game yeah right i mean fortunate fortunately They go through with it, and they end up going and, and fighting this 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 battle with Ramoth Gilead, and uh, one of them dies. Is it is it Ahab or is it? It goes just as it's as as Yahweh says it's gonna yeah. go. They they lose, right? And there's this other great great <laughs> great image in the story where it says that uh, the the that the dogs uh, yeah. drank the the water with the blood. Yeah of the kings in it and the whores the prostitutes bathed in it too but yeah so it, it ends up going the way yahweh intended for it to go but it, it ends up going badly for for ahab but not no thanks to micaiah yeah at that point yeah i just make one comment about what you said josh and this goes into this whole he spills the beans i find it interesting of course that they already expect him to be negative in mm-hmm. everything mm-hmm what really makes that weird for me, all right, we keep assuming Ahab's the bad guy. Okay, you yeah. know, we've done this several times when we talk to Christians. When the Bible says those other people that we go and conquer and take their women and whatnot, they deserved that. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder about the real Ahab, if he even oh, deserved yeah. any of this. And so, like, the question oh, I sure. have is, like, if there is this Micaiah and he's, like, always giving bad, negative report from Yahweh, what does that say about Yahweh? What does yeah. that say about how angry and how, wh- what kind of God is this? And, and this is why I think having this ancient Near Eastern context is so important in these in these circumstances, because like if you look at uh, the Assyrian Empire, for example, the Assyrian Empire is sort of uh, one of its, um, I don't know, mission statements is we're going to campaign annually, right? That's what we're going to do. And but before they go on these campaigns, uh, quite often you have these types of uh, oracles. Uh, you know they, they're doing the same thing. What they're doing is they're uh, provoking uh, a message to be given by the gods, right? So they're saying, okay, like uh, tell us, tell us if we're going to do this. So you have this whole host of. And for some reason, I'm blanking on the the name now. But they're these uh, these tablets to the sun god. They're in, um, like invocations to oracles to the sun god, or something to that effect. Uh, but they're you know they're they're saying give us a good you know give us a good yes if we're gonna you know supposed to go forward on this campaign or supposed to go and do this other thing. And so the, if if you do have a consistent uh, uh, return from your person who is designated or uh, appointed 
to speak to the deity. And they're always coming back with no, no, no. If you think about what the Neo-Assyrian mission was, it's working on behalf of the deity to mm -hmm. march against these other nations. And so the, the God himself, as you were saying, in a sense, is is not doing what he is supposed to do from that perspective. So right. just in a nutshell, let me make sure I'm right. I love this. Mm -hmm. Gods of nations, because they were they were, as Paula Fragerson phrased a great article one time, or she did a lecture. The the gods are in the blood, so like nations or tribes are usually connect. Like the the piece of land or the people of that land are usually connected with their deity in some way. That god is usually supposed to protect, and and when they would yeah. fail to do so, that was a failure of a god. And oftentimes, other people would adapt that deity because that nation would conquer or whatever. Oftentimes. Yeah. Here we have Yahweh explicitly working against, if you take this narrative in the ancient Near East, against his own people, the king of his own nation. And he's like really wanting these other nations. He wants to lie so that Ahab will go and get his, you know what, kicked, yeah. ass handed to him. Next thing you know, it's like, yay, Yahweh, we yeah. punished our own people. Yeah. yeah. Like over and over and over yeah. this happens. And this, like, this is why, first of all, it's no accident, right? I mean, as you were talking about the Deuteronom the mm -hmm. Deuteronomist, like if you think back to Deuteronomy 28, like this is the point, right? Uh, Deuteronomy 28 is like a, a, a parallel version, uh, let me see, with, with some distinctions from like Leviticus 26, but it's all of these, if you obey me, here are all the blessings that you're going to get. If you disobey me, I'm going to curse the fuck out of you. Yeah. Right. And it's part of this like Neo-Assyrian vassal treaty formula. And so when the Deuteronomist is writing, why is it that Yahweh's always coming back with negative answers? And it's because the kings are wicked, right? They're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. And so it's ultimately spun back to, to, to it's what's well, the king, right? It's the people, yeah. it's the rebellion, mm -hmm. right? But in reality, what's supposed to be happening is that, that the God is supposed to be working on behalf of the people through this just, pious, righteous king who's going forth uh, and, 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 you know, marching against these other peoples uh, on behalf of the deity. But it is, it is all spin, though. Yes. Right? Like, yeah. And I think that's, that's one of the things that's very fascinating. Uh, in particular about the Deuteronomist, because Ahab uh, is the, the grandson of Omri. On the basis of the literature that we have of the period, on the basis of what, what uh, the archaeology tells us, Omri controlled, yeah. he was a very, very successful ruler. Yeah. He had a dynasty yeah. that was probably unrivaled in its, in its uh, wealth, power, reach, and influence within this region in the period. He's barely mentioned by the Deuteronomist. Like the Deuteronomist does not care, and this is intentional. Um, and I think this is, the, lots of, of what what's going on politically here is playing out in this story. Jehoshaphat is the one who's, who's you know, coming up and, and giving Ahab the, the right advice of what he should be doing. Right. But this is all very much it's it's very much playing out this little brother syndrome where you've got tiny little Judah who is out here in the hinterlands. Um, in reality, this is a they are barely a kingdom like it's it's a uh, it's it's a it's a it's a city on a hilltop that controls this this little area. And and uh, I had it, an apologist get really upset at me one time because I referred to it as a backwater. It is. Right? It's, and it's not a backwater. <laughs> Same person that got upset at me for talking about the ancient Israelite cult. Oh, boy. <laughs> but, but, this is, but this is like, like this is the, the Deuteronomist is painting this picture that is so, it is so contrary to reality um, throughout his entire work where he's got to do everything he can to downplay the success of the Omrid, hmm. the Omrid dynasty, which includes Ahab. And that's why uh, Ahab is the brunt of so much of the criticism of the Deuteronomist throughout this, um, because he's, he's working against the success of this, this realm. Um, and really, I think this is one of the ways, one of the only ways in which he can he can offer to explain this is that uh, Ahab was just this 
this terrible bad guy who thwarted or attempted to thwart Yahweh at every at every turn. And this is like the the, the Deuteronomist has to has to just kind of pile up all these these accusations against him at every point. And this is why be, be, the reason I think that uh, this is important to do and it's something to fight back against uh, in the mind of the Deuteronomist is yeah. because there is this one to one correlation in the mind of you know ancient ancient Near Eastern writers that if there's a successful kingdom, the God is on their side, yeah. right? So like when you think about the Umalagash border conflict back in the third millennium, the early dynastic period, the reason that Lagash is winning against Uma is because Ningirsu is up like in the spiritual realm behind the scenes fighting on their behalf. That's why they're winning, right? And so if you have a successful Ahab, well, that 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 you you would have to conclude that Yahweh's on their side, and that that's yeah. that's not what you want. So you you as you say you take and you try to spin it uh, to make him the bad guy. Manasseh has a particularly long reign, yes, you know, right. and of course, who's the child sacrifice guy, yeah. you know? So it, yeah, I mean, I think these are the, uh, the worst the worst king in, in yeah. all of Israel. But what did he know, reign like fifty years? Yeah, or something? It was something some like long that. Ass it's reign. This ridiculous long reign, and by all. You know, it, it certainly looks like we have some reflection of this in Deuteronomy, or sorry, in, in the book of Jeremiah. I think when um, in Jeremiah chapter forty-four, there's 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 a section where um, the people are sacrificing the Malecha Hashemayim, the mm. Queen of Heaven, right? And uh, I, I think this is kind of a, kind of a reflection on what life was like in the old days. Mm. They say they tell Jeremiah directly this. You know, back when we you know, we've always sacrificed, we've, we've always worshipped the queen of the heavens. We've always offered libations to her. And over this period of time, you know, we were safe. We were well looked after. We had enough to eat. Our lives were good. So why wouldn't we continue to do this? You know, I, and uh, it, it just, uh, it's it's this weird, um, it, it it's this weird reversal that the Deuteronomist and, and several of the other prophets are, are, are constantly doing throughout the Hebrew texts where they, they can't really do otherwise because these, these kingdoms were successful. Yeah. So this, <clears throat> this is a really interesting point. It, it spins us back to God, Yahweh. Mm -hmm. Okay, You're talking about the Deuteronomist, which means we're probably talking about the Yahweh source here. And... In, in that, we're looking at who is Yahweh? I mean, it's a worthy question to ask. This nomadic deity who doesn't really seem to want kingdoms. I did not want you to have a king like the other nations. Mm -hmm. I wanted you to be, you know, and it's almost like every time the voice, which is really the person or the author that's conveying it. I did this to John Dominic Cross. But God said, he was, God never said with his Irish accent, the men in the text wrote, God never said. So we need to understand who these people are and their God. And their God seems to be the opposite of, well, we did this in the first video on God lying, which was the, the ziggurat is the peak. No, that's the, the lowest point you can go is to go up. And so down is up and up is down. Everything is opposite as you described. Great kingdoms are bad news, not yeah. good. You need to you need to go and be nomadic, mm -hmm. tribesmen in the wilderness, listen to that still calm voice that you get after being dehydrated for 80 hours and not eating and hallucinating in the wilderness. That's Yahweh. Go meet him. I mean, I'm being funny with that. But the point is, this God and what this God wants seems so contrary to a typical civilized deity that is known in the world. It's odd to me. It's just really odd taking this, where's the blame game, right? I would say, obviously, they think God wrote this. Well, then you put it on God. Now, since we aren't in a position saying we think this God is real, then it makes me want to know who are these people and where do they get these concepts and why do they want opposite from what looks to be satisfying as a kingdom, ruling, having power, all of this. Where did that ideology come from? I mean, that's an incredibly complex, <laughs> complex question. I mean, I think one of the things that we have to remember 
is when these texts are being compiled, mm -hmm. when they're being written. And some of the questions that are rattling around in the minds of the authors are like, why has shit played out the way that it has? And so a, a perfect example of this, right, would be something like the book of Daniel. You know, Daniel and Daniel chapter nine, you have this lengthy, beautifully written section that talks about Daniel reading through uh, essentially reading through the book of Jeremiah, which is playing, and, and this is being, you know, sort of put together with Leviticus 25 and probably parts of Leviticus 26, and coming up with this, like, theological explanation for why it is that shit's still bad. Why are we still, you know, un under the thumb of all these other powers? And so, uh, again, setting this back into the 6th century then, uh, and, uh, you know, making... Daniel have this understanding of, wait a minute, why is it that, you know, we're here? Oh, you know, it's, it's, it's actually not 70 years that we're supposed to be in captivity, but 70 times seven, because that's what Leviticus 26 talks about. And it's, but it's, again, it's trying to make sense of the political situation in which they find themselves in contrast to what they would have expected at the time. And so I think we need to be really careful when we read these texts to be able to say, like that one more thing that I'll point out, when you read through something like Leviticus 26 um, or Deuteronomy 28, so many of the things that you see as if you disobey, this is what will happen. Read through the Deuteronomistic history and watch them take place. Oh, yeah. And it's no coincidence, right? When it says, like, don't multiply to yourself horses as a king and don't multiply to yourself wives. What the hell? Solomon gets Solomon, a bunch yes. of a bunch of horses, a bunch and of wives. Like, wives. it's like, yeah. like, you know, two plus two is four, <laughs> you know. So, I, I again, I think that, that there's this... I'll call it beautiful because I mean I really think that it is from a literary standpoint yeah. mm -hmm. and from an artistic standpoint you have this amalgamation this trying to work together uh, of the political situation in which they find themselves trying to explain it theologically but yet trying to reflect the reality as they saw it on the ground it's 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 very, very complex. Right. Um, so so to put it in another way to answer my question, which we there might be an ideology back there. We just don't know exactly where the influence have come from for opposite uh, ideology. But if, if, if we're not looking there for the source, the other source is just look out your window or just look out the front door. Hmm. That's your reality. Everyone, Jim, Bob, Billy, Susie, everyone out in the ancient world would have seen these things, had to have dealt with them. And so in their mind... They rationalized it by saying, well, this is this is the fate that obviously our God has given us. Yeah. And so rather than blame their God, and sometimes they do, sometimes the prophets cry out, why, Yahweh, have you done this? Uh, you know, and then they kind of will put it on them, spin it on them and say, hey, turn your people back, yeah. you know, because obviously they got to blame somebody and it can't be God the whole time. It, it's it's kind of weird. I imagine maybe if we flipped it around and said the Assyrians, did they ever blame their gods? Did oh, they, of course. Yeah. They blame them for the failures that they got defeated by the Babylonians. Or yeah, like, I mean, think, mm -hmm. think about when Shuchuk Nuhunta, uh, you know, takes uh, the Stele of Hammurabi, right? And then he's, he, the, the Stele is brought back. This, this whole notion is that Marduk has said, you know, uh, I'm out of here, right? And when the deity leaves, because he's, a, you know, he's abandoned them sometimes or that they've, they've been disobedient, whatever, it, it, it reflects this this uh what do we call this hedge of protection mm -hmm. that the deity puts up um and so that the explanation for why this has happened it it, it is because think about the sumerian king list and then i'll be quiet <laughs> but, but if you think about the sumerian king list or you think about the curse of agade these literary texts everything focuses on there is a period of time that the gods have allotted for a king to rule, for a, for a, mm -hmm. for a dynasty to rule or whatever. But, you know, Naram Sin tries to buck against this, right? <laughs> he reads the omens. He doesn't like them. So he tries to buck against this. And, like, it all goes bad for him. And that's the message that the, that the, the, the literary texts and these lamentational liturgies and all these things are trying to get forth or put forward is that the gods are the ones that say this is where the kingship will sit for now but as soon as they want to take it back up and put it somewhere else lo and behold it's when that city falls right and mm -hmm. so it, it's it's something that makes things make sense for them 
This works. I was gonna say this kind of works in in reverse too, because what what uh, you take a look at what uh, what Cyrus did mm -hmm. when he when he came into Babylon. Yep. What did he do? He he came in and said, "So Neba uh, um, Nabonidus has bucked because yep. he's he's kind of a weird guy, and he and he and he's out of the. He's not part of this ruling family that is that is." controlled Babylon during the Neo-Babylonian period. And one of the weird things he does is he abandons the the Temple of Marduk and he goes off and, and starts worshiping uh, Sim. It's mm -hmm. Sim, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, what, is, what does Cyrus do? When he's beginning his campaign against Babylon, he starts promoting himself as, you know, the, the servant of Marduk. Yep coming to save the city of Babylon from this terrible ruler who is, who is, uh, he's the one who betrayed Marduk. I'm the savior, you know, and uh, yeah. It, and where else is he a savior? Yeah. <laughs> You're right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like exactly. Cyrus got the best of the best, eh? sure you know, did. like he's a suffering yeah. servant. You yeah. Know? <laughs> he gets, but boy, was yeah. he, a, I mean, I mean, it's a very, very canny uh, political move. Yeah. Yeah. To, to assume that role, right? As your, uh, yeah. What I do think is interesting, just on like tying the bow there, that it, I think you'll also agree, is that how they have built their framework with their deity. Notice we don't have uh, Marduk worship today. I mean, if there's someone, it's not systematic. It's not like, like it hasn't been an ongoing religion ever since. Notice all of these kingdoms and all of their gods and their beliefs in these gods really have fallen apart. It, but you have a unique people who kept their their deity and it's almost like they created this loop in their theology to always still keep god whatever mm -hmm. happens to us whether it's completely horrific and god lets us be killed in gas chambers the horrific holocaust situation to hey we went back in 1948 and we're, we're getting land back we're back in the maybe we build a temple one day it doesn't matter what happens and while i see that as clever personally as a humanist as someone in a world where we i want to break down those kind of divisions and mm -hmm. stuff i think it's sad for me mm -hmm. i understand there's beauty and you can look at it two different ways um it's interesting but i find it ironic that they've made a system to where there's no way to finally look for for most that are in it to go okay come on are we really is there is this yahweh really over us really controlling us or is it us all along? This is what I think makes this type of hermeneutical approach that the text does itself so interesting. And to be be just a quick caveat, like I said, the suffering servant. I don't think that Isaiah no. 53 is actually about Cyrus. I was referring to just the servant. I should have yeah. said suffering. But anyway, because I know somebody's out there listening going, ah! Yeah. ah. <laughs> um, so, but, um, but if you look at inter- textual exegesis we just talked about it right in the book of daniel uh, but you see this in apocalyptic literature in general and so it's one of the reasons that christianity is able to maintain what they've maintained because the way that apocalyptic literature is structured uh, we did an interview with oh my gosh why am i blanking on his name he's up at Theolo uh, virginia theological seminary stephen cook and he wrote uh, a really nice book on apocalyptic literature and what he said uh was uh, it's it's and it, of course he's not the only one that said it but i mean he, he pointed it out that the ambiguity um of apocalyptic literature allows it to uh be something that is uh fulfilled now but not yet fulfilled now but not yet and the way that he described it i thought it was a really apt uh analogy was if you're driving up a mountain you know there's a there's a road that's been cut along the outside of this mountain and it's going up in concentric circles if you get too close to the edge you're, you're looking down uh, and it's like, oh, that's really close, steer back. And, and, and if, you, if you come, oh, we're really close to the edge and steer back. Well, in each case, you're looking at the end, right? Mm -hmm. You're looking at your end. Um, it's not a different end in the sense that it's the same one that you're looking at each time, but it's at different points that you're looking at the same one. And so the way that apocalyptic literature was structured, it's like the when they would make specific predictions about like Antiochus the Fourth Epiphanes, it's like they were getting really close to the edge in their minds in this interpretive structure. They got really close to the edge, but God pulled them back, right? So it's it's not that it, it failed. They got to see it a little bit, but then it came back. Mm -hmm. 
right? And that allows this sort of, yep, that was the end, but not really. And so it can be, it can be more the and, same. And the same stuff is playing out in, uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls in the Qumran literature. One of the things that, that you see that's, that's consistent within their own self-understanding. So we look at the literature and in our attempts to reconstruct who these people are that, that wrote the text, we know some things. We know that there was some sort of dispute within the Jerusalem temple. We know that the leader of the community was, was disenfranchised uh, as a result of this. We, you know, we're, we're, we're pretty confident uh, about this having been something that took place. The problem is we don't know when hmm. because the wicked priest was a guy who had a name. Uh, but frustratingly, the writers of the Dead Sea Scrolls don't ever use those names. And I think this is part of why. Yeah. Like they are, they are living in this already but now yet uh, kind of point of expectation where there is some kind of subconscious realization, I think, that as close as these people feel like they are to the end, to the to the day of the Lord. There's there's something there which would which is is part of this, right? Like we're watching this history unfold. It's it's happening before our eyes. The prophets have have told us and, and we can see our you know our existence, our life, our our uh, everything's unfolding just as the prophets said, but I think there's some recognition in there that in order to ensure the, the the circulation of of these ideas or these 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 texts, we can't name names. We can't be too clear about uh, about everything that's going on. So that's how you, you know you end up with the teacher of righteousness. Was there just one teacher of righteousness? Was this a figure spawned other teachers of righteousness through the history of the Qumran community? Was there always just one wicked priest, or were there other wicked priests that they could point to and say, oh yeah, you know? This was spoken of in our own literature. You can almost see, I mean, the, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls community, the people who wrote and collected them, it, it came to an end at, uh, you know, with the, uh, with the destruction of uh, Jerusalem and with the invasion of the Romans during the Jewish War. But what would have happened if that hadn't happened and they had continued? Would they have started to reconsult these texts and start to point to a new future, you know, new priests of new wicked priests and new teachers of righteousness. It be this is how something like this becomes a literary genre. And I see it today, even with people talking about the Euphrates drying up. Like how many times has the Euphrates come right. close to drying yeah. up? I mean, you know. Well, think about that show Parks and Rec. I mean, I think it's a perfect example of it, if I do say so myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> his bow ties are cool. Um, <clears throat> uh, he uh, there's a there's a cult that meets once a year to uh, to like have the end of the world. There's a big dragon that's gonna melt everybody's flesh off or something. And uh, of course, it doesn't happen, and nobody's surprised. And and so you see him at the very end of the show. That the the cult leader uh, comes up and he says, um, oh, "You know, he's got his you know old tattered book there." And he goes, "Yeah, I I I was as surprised as anyone that he didn't come back. But I went back and really dug into the to the text, and I realized that I hadn't accounted." For this year so it's actually going to be next year on may 27th so if we could book the park then and leslie nope looks down <laughs> at her kind of goes oh um may 27th is an ice cream social and he goes oh did i say may 27th uh, there's another day that's may 28th and she goes yeah it's free then and he goes okay great that's she goes and if you could put us down for a couple of tickets to that ice cream social <laughs> But I mean, that's what it is, right? It's this ability for the text to reinterpret itself um, in that in that odd sort of way. The way that Daniel can look and, uh, or the writer of Daniel can look and say, why are we sitting here in the second century and it's still all at pop? Let's have Daniel figure out that it's not just 70 years yeah. of Jeremiah 25, but it's actually 70 times seven because that's what Leviticus 26 tells us. Uh, and it, it gives that now 490 years instead of 70. And it but never ends. Amen. Amen. Yeah. You know, this underscores though too the that what what some 
what happens, what, what makes scripture scripture? Hmm. One of the things that makes scripture scripture is, is this idea that there's, there's, there's something magical embedded within the text that you didn't see the first time that you looked at it or the second or the third time. But maybe, you know, there's always new things that you can, you can see within the text. It's kind of interesting that, that Daniel is set on this, this passage of Jeremiah and he understands this as a prophecy of expectation, right? That the exile is going to come to end, come to an end after 70 years. That's his focus. Within the original setting of that text, this, this, is, this appears in a letter that Jeremiah delivered to the, the captives who were living in Babylon from the first, uh, from, from the, the first captivity. Yeah. which took place in, in uh, uh, five, I think it was 590, 597 or 594. The, the, first, the first group went to go live in Babylon. Jeremiah supposedly writes this letter to them. And the reason he writes this letter and the reason he says this to them is not to encourage them <laughs> that they're coming back. <laughs> right. He says to them, because what's going on is in Babylon, they're going, you know, in two years. Yeah. We're coming back. Yeah. Jeremiah has to write to them and go, no, 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 no. Stay put. Yeah. Build houses. Give your sons and daughters for marriage and, and marry. Yep. Because it's not going to be two years. <laughs> it's going to be like 70 years, yeah. right? This is not, this is not a, a prophecy of hope. This is a prophecy of, cool your jets, man. You're stuck. For a long time yeah so but you know daniel's able to turn that into something and and this is all we can think of when we look at this at this uh th this passage anymore just because of the interpretive lens that's been that's been set on it it almost doesn't it almost surprises people when they go back and they look at it and they think about it and they're like oh wow it actually meant something completely different than i ever imagined it did yeah 